great, thanks. Um, this is a short talk since Jed and I are dividing the time. Um, so, but I've split mine into two parts. In the first part, I'm going to talk a little bit about the initial founding of the Gorm Company Archive in the mid-1980s and 90s. And the second part, I'm going to take you back on a little walk through antebellum providence. So what I want to do in this first section is give you some detail that is not actually in the catalog chapter um, on the founding of the Gorm Company Archive. Um, which we were only able to address briefly in the chapter. One of the themes that is articulated well in the exhibit upstairs is the notion of Gorham's perfect system of manufacturing. Part and parcel of that system were the records that the company created to document every aspect of its manufacturing process. Um, that included not only design sketches and presentation drawings, but technical schematics, casting patterns and chasing patterns, costing ledgers, marketing brochures, and photo product photographs, uh, just to name the, the minimal uh, aspects of this. The company kept these materials not solely as an historical archive of its past production, but because the records were useful for its ongoing production. In fact, Gora mined its own archive heavily, seeking in its former successes and failures a continuing array of fresh jumping off points for new designs and patterns, for necessary adjustments in manufacturing processes, and for innovative product lines. But when the price of silver suddenly began to spike at more than $31 an ounce in February of 1974, the company, which had survived so many downturns in its long history, faced its most serious challenge yet, a rapidly declining consumer base. Over the course of the next decade, the price of silver remained volatile, not receding significantly below $30 an ounce until September of 1983, leading to high prices for consumers. The silver consumer wares that were still the hallmark of Gorham production thus receded in popularity, decelerating especially after the price peaked at more than $116 an ounce in the early months of 1980. Customers increasingly switched to less costly options, such as stainless steel, for flatware, and did not look back. In the midst of this great trial, two fortuitous events occurred that would have a profound impact on the public legacy of the Gorham Company. First, Charles Carpenter, a recently retired corporate executive and a well-established art collector in his own right, approached the company about writing an independent history of its design trends and production. The second was that Samuel J. Huff, errant medievalist and sometime librarian, decided to resign his post at the John Carter Brown Library in order to establish himself as an independent Rhode Island bookseller and appraiser. Art historians, collectors, and other aficionados of the decorative arts are today well aware of Carpenter's path-breaking book, Gorham Silver, 1831 to 1981, still a valuable reference tool more than three decades after its initial publication. But the contributions of Sam Huff are relatively little known outside of a small circle of those who knew and worked with him. It is on Sam and his work that I therefore want to focus this section of the talk. I believe it was Sam who first alerted his friend and colleague, Mark Brown, the Hay Library's curator of manuscripts, that Gorham was downsizing the Adelaide Avenue plant and that the company would soon move its existing production lines and its design department to smaller facilities elsewhere. Old drawings and other key documents about Gorham products were on their way to the dumpster. In short, Gorham, under the exigencies of exiting a large, antiquated, and now underutilized plant, was about to trash its own historical archive, the same archive that had once been so useful to the company in generating new ideas and products in satisfaction of consumer desires. Hence was launched a mission that would consume much of the rest of Sam's life, the next 30 years, rescuing company records, 
creating a safe home for Gorham materials at the John Hay Library, and making this archive useful to art curators, collectors, and other interested researchers. Sam worked assiduously, aided and abetted by Mark Brown, to identify, organize, and collect the most meaningful Gorham records that he could find in the morass of the downsizing factory. In an unsigned memo he titled The Gorham Paper Trail, dating from about the mid-1990s, he detailed some of this work. During exploration of the factory after the company had left the building, he wrote, I encountered a room full of records in a walk-in safe on the second floor of the North Wing. My attempts to rescue this material form a story in themselves. In the spring of 1994, Brown received an anonymous gift to pay a locksmith to open the safe with permission of and cooperation from the city of Providence. There was much more material than I had remembered, requiring several truckloads, plus my station wagon to remove it all. At about the same time, Sam learned that some of the records removed by the company to the smaller facilities were under threat. Historical records that had been moved out to Johnston with the design department were badly damaged by water after a, ba a basement pipe burst. Some of the materials were not retrievable. Meanwhile, the company's famed design library, farmed out to the Smithfield factory, was housed in flimsy boxes. Using his company connections, Sam managed to worm his way into the facility where, he wrote, I had the pleasure of removing the books from their difficult storage and making a list of the battered survivors. The worst case he encountered, though, was that of the hundreds of cubic feet of legal and historical records that had once been housed in the secretary's vault at Adelaide Avenue. Hauled up to the top floor of an old textile mill in Woonsocket for storage, they sat in execrable circumstances uh, for several years while the roof over them collapsed, leaving them open to water infiltration and prey to infestations of nesting pigeons and falling paint chips. And they were, of course, covered by with significant mold growth by that point. Appalled at the neglect, Sam took it upon himself to rescue those that were in the most serious condition, filling his station wagon several times over and spending his evenings treating the damaged records. Here he describes his rather unorthodox and really not archivally sound method of addressing the moldy paper. The mold which grows on paper is related to that which grows on feet. A bookbinder had revealed to me his trick of using foot powder to arrest and kill such fungus. Two containers later, I had treated most of the paper. When I reworked that material, I found that my first aid had served its purpose. I did find active fungus, but only in places I hadn't treated. Needless to say, um, that the making of an archive, much like uh, making of legislation and sausage, is something not for the faint of heart. <laughs> As indicated in this memo, there wasn't much that Sam was not willing to do for the purpose of rescuing the Gore materials, which has so captured his imagination. Years later, he confided to me conspiratorially about his effort to have some of the more beautiful Gorham drawings uh, saved. He had learned that some of the company executives wanted finely colored presentation drawings framed to hang in their offices. Sam, fearing that the, these drawings would soon be whisked away from the company offices as the executives were laid off, offered to arrange for the framing. In the process, he surreptitiously created color photocopies of the drawings, <laughs> then framed the photocopies and brought the original drawings to the Hay Library. Sam's rescue and retrieval experiences not only led directly to the growth of the Gorham Archive at the Hay Library, they also pushed Sam into a new pathway. He became a researcher devoted to all things Gorham, compiling and scanning historical Gorham catalogs, which he issued and sold on CD-ROM, offering specialized research services to collectors and curators, writing articles and reports on various Gorham product lines, mostly for Silver Magazine, and in publishing both in print and to his website, his own original research on the craftsmen and craftswomen who had worked for, for the Gorham Company since its founding. 
Sadly, Sam Huff passed away two months ago from complications of diabetes without ever having had the chance to see the wonderful exhibit that Elizabeth and Emily have created. And it's completely unfortunate in the sense that Sam, the exhibit really both relies on and is the culmination and part of his long-term rescue effort to save these records. But his work still lives on through his research in the reg roster of Gorham Craftsmen, seen here, um, which is still accessible to the public through the good offices of the folks at the Internet Archive through the Wayback Machine. And this is where this screenshot was taken from. And also, his spirit is still alive in the attention that we continue to give to the history of the Gorham Manufacturing Company and its production of elegant silverwares. So I dedicate this entirety, the entirety of this talk to Sam's memory. So now I turn to something that Sam sometimes mentioned when he spoke about the Gorham Archive, and that is the way in which the archive builds upon and complements collections at the Hay Library that pre-existed it, but that also document the history of Providence. This section will rely on two intertwined themes in our holdings, spectacle and photography. In the early years of the young American Republic, it seems, Providence was awash in spectacle. What I mean here by the use of this term aligns with its dictionary definition as a visually striking performance or display. Spectacle took many forms in antebellum providence as shown on these period broadsides. From theatrical pieces with magical illuminations to patriotic musical performances. From the temporary exhibition of historical and allegorical paintings to grand historical panoramas from the circus sideshow performance to the introduction of fantastical animals from faraway places. Providence even hosted its own branch of the short-lived American Art Union, an early pre-RISD attempt to educate and enlighten the artistic sensibilities of an avid public to contemporary American art by distributing fine art prints by subscription and by lottery. Each and every one of these efforts reflected an attempt to capitalize on a growing audience of middle-brow customers with leisure time, expendable income, and a thirst for entertainments. Photography would soon become another means for capturing the local zeitgeist. Perhaps fittingly, fittingly the story of photography in Providence begins with our sometime uh, 19th century celebrity visitor, Edgar Allan Poe. After Daguerre's publication of the manual for his photographic process in 1839, practitioners of the new art quickly set up shop in our fair city. By the mid-1840s, Samuel Masry and S.W. Hartshorn were operating a successful daguerreotype studio on the second floor of number 25 Westminster Street. And for those of you who are not in the know, that is where the Fleet Library is right now. Um, and that is where Edgar Allan Poe went to have his photograph taken on November 13, 1848, after a tumultuous week which included an intentional overdose of a laudanum and a bout of heavy drinking, hence the disheveled appearance. <laughs> the resulting daguerreotype, shown here, was intended for Providence poet Sarah Helen Whitman as an engagement present from Poe, <laughs> after she finally consented to marry him following an intense pursuit through the stacks at the Athenaeum and multiple refused proposals. The engagement would not last long, though Whitman kept the daguerreotype as a memento of their courtship, noting in an 1874 letter Poe's sweet and serene expression. Sadly, Masary and Hartshorn's partnership did not long outlive the failed engagement. They parted ways in 1850, and with Masary's department from, departure from Providence, Hartshorn soon abandoned photography to become a manufacturer of lamp wicks. Still, the impact of this early photographic practice on the development of photography in Providence was significant, for Masary and Hartshorn had engaged two budding young photographers to man their camera, Edwin and Henry Manchester by name. 
After the demise of Masry and Hartshorn, the Manchesters opened their own business under the name of Manchester Brothers at number 33 Westminster Street, styling themselves in the manner of their former mentors as Daguerrean artists. And here is an image of a slide of a different uh, Daguerrean artist from the same period. Their shop would remain a local fixture at various locations on Westminster Street for decades to come. By 1856, they had moved They had moved their shop to number 73 Westminster Street and taken on a partner, Joshua B. Chapin, a physician. By the 1860s, they had exchanged Chapin for a new partner, Daniel Angel Jr. Photography exploded as a popular pastime in Providence of this period, just as it did elsewhere in the country. With the development of the albumin print in the 1850s, paper prints came to dominate the trade. By 1855, at about the same time that Gorham set up its own studio, the albumin print had become the predominant medium for making photographic prints. Though albumin print papers were commercially available, most photographers simply albuminized their own print papers. The lower cost and easy availability of albumin prints also made possible the quick replication of many images from a single photographic negative which transformed the photographer's studio from a local artisanal shop into an emporium of mass reproduction on something that more nearly approached a national scale. The process of printing photographic images was simpler, less laborious, and much less expensive using albumin papers than it was on the highly polished metal plates required for daguerreotypes or the more fragile glass plates used for ambrotypes. Simple changes in the way photographers presented themselves in the Providence Directory document these shifts. The Manchester brothers, at the publication of the 1856 Directory, were no longer listed as Daguerrean artists, but instead as daguerreotypists. By 1857, they were listed as photographers. In the 1860 Directory, the first which contained a separate listing of businesses organized by type, 13 businesses were listed under the heading daguerreotypes, embrotypes, photographs, and only one of these placed an ad in the directory. But business appears to have been competitive for these shops as the number of ads in the directory the following year increased exponentially to six. By 1865, there were 19 different shops listed under the reordered heading photographs, daguerreotypes, ambrotypes, in locations along Westminster Street. With so much popular interest in the photographic image, well-known photographers like Matthew Brady were able to copyright their images and sell the copy negatives to other photographers so that consumers in Providence could easily obtain and even collect the latest images of the famous and infamous in New York and Washington, as well as of themselves and their Rhode Island friends. Providence photographers also began branding local stock images for sale to the public. Okay. Oh, sorry. That's the Manchester Brothers Lincoln. Uh, here's the stock image of the arcade, um, which also served as a cost-effective means of advertising businesses. So here you see a RISD museum image um, with Leander Baker's name on one edge. And here is the exact same image with a different photographer uh, on the other edge. The same uh, basic uh, stereoscopic view on a, or, and an orange card. I speak of these particular elements of antebellum po popular culture in Providence because they are part of the general mil milieu that Jabez Gorham inhabited, into which John Gorham was born and raised um, at the time when the Gorham Manufacturing Company was brought to life and had its heyday. It is no accident that, after adopting photography for the purpose of documenting its own products in the mid-1850s, the company soon opened its studio to ordinary consumers. for purposes of portrait photography, or that it produced that giant spoon that Elizabeth just showed you up in the exhibit. In engaging existing popular tropes of consumption, the company saw from early on an opening to reach into the hearts, minds, and pockets of consumers. And for more on that, I will now turn you over to Jed Carbone. 
Well, we have uh, 20 minutes to do the 19th century, so let's do it. Right, right here we are looking at um, essentially the founding document of Gorham Silver. Um, there are three parties uh, involved in signing this document. Most importantly is a young Jabez Gorham. He's 14 years old. His mother is there. His father isn't. His father was a harness maker. He had died a few years before. And within the next year, and she may have known this, her mother would be dead. So she was signing her 14-year-old son over to uh, live with and learn the, the mastery, the mystery, the art trader mystery of gold, silversmith, and jewelry from Nehemiah Dodge, um, who had learned the trade from a much older brother, almost a father figure for him. So now, the, so the, the young uh, Jabez that is really indenturing himself to a very 18th century and beyond uh, practice uh, of apprenticeships. And even this form, I love this form, it uses the long S, you know, the indenture witness this. The, they, he signs this in 1806 when Thomas Jefferson is president. That's how far back the company's roots go. So he, uh, he also agrees, this 14-year-old kid, that he, uh, he shall not commit fornication or contract matrimony. At cards, dice, or any other lawful game, he shall not play, and nor shall he haunt alehouses, playhouses, or taverns. So they, they had everything covered. And, uh, <laughs> and he, uh, he was a good boy. He, he said to uh, his son later, to, to John Gorham, that... Um, Nehemiah was kind and indulgent to the boys, and he, he fulfilled his, uh, his, his terms of his apprenticeship. And at 21, he and a few other apprentices from around Providence formed their own company. And this is the kind of thing they would be making there, um, banging out silver spoons. These are John Gorham pieces. And uh, he could do in a 10-hour day maybe two of these, you know, with a, with a hammer and just bang out silver spoons and thimbles. And uh, he also eventually invented a method of linking gold chain that was known as Gorham chain. And uh, so he, he carried on that business and another, a partner of his really carried out the spoon business and they were doing pretty well. And here he is uh, as, a, as an older man. Um, and I love the difference between him and his son. Because like, look at him, he's staring straight at the camera kind of myopically staring almost into the 1700s. Um, and here's his son, you know, very self stylist self-consciously, you know, looking into the future. Um, and now John Gorham, he, he grew up in a providence that was uh, uh, the center for technological convergence in, in the United States. Um, he... There was, there was an English toolmaker, James Nasmith, who said that there is not a New England boy of average ability who does not have some idea of, of inventing a new machine to improve his fortune. He, he was walking around this city at a time when you know, the different lyceums and the Athenaeum were hosting multiple meetings a week um, to discuss different scientific processes. And in fact, at the Athenaeum, uh, a, a speaker came to talk about laughing gas, and, and Lucian Sharp, who was uh, John Gorham's cousin's brother-in-law uh, <laughs> from Brown and Sharp, re recalled of the, um, the laughing gas that, that the presenter let them inhale it. And, and, a tall, and a tall time was had, make no mistake. <laughs> so, so this kid who grows up in, uh, you know, in this kind of a dynamic 19th century providence, he's not going to sit there with a spoon, banging, you know, with a hammer, banging out spoons all day. At first, his father, when he's 18 years old, his father says, come join the company. And uh, he gets fired within months. He, he, he clashed with the foreman. Um, three years, so then he tried to be a farmer and a clerk. And a clerk was a new occupation in the New Republic. And it, it was garbed in respectability. You got to wear a coat and tie. And, but it was actually hard work. You're behind the desk all day and uh, didn't pay much with no upward mobility. So after a few years of that, um, 
it, his father said, look, my partner is selling out his side of the business. Um, I'll buy it with one, this is 1841, so Jabez has already been at this business for 35 years now. He says, I'll buy it under one condition, that is that you will join me in the firm. At 21 years old, after trying farming and clerking, he's like, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll do this. But again, he, he does not want to sit there. He tells us, he convinces his father to borrow $17,000 and build uh, a factory, and, you, know, you know, a little three and a half story factory here, and outfit it with a 50 horsepower steam engine. Prior to this, uh, Gorham and his partner, their, their motive power was a horse named Old Dick. And Old Dick would walk in a circle and turn a windlass, and they would, you know, nail their silver, heat it up, and stretch it out, and that that's, was their motive power. Well, John was like, nah, you know, he's growing up in a place where George Collis has just, you know, made major advances in harnessing valves and steam engines to make them much more efficient. And he's, I'm, I'm installing one of those, Dad. Dad's like, okay. But then Dad gets cold feet. And in 1847, just before this opens up, he says, John, I'm out. I'm retiring. It's all yours. So John Gorham takes this over. And one of the things he does is with his steam engine is he's been over to Reed and Barton. I think at least the, you know, that when their second name was Reed and Barton over in Taunton, Massachusetts. And he had seen how they used lathes steam-powered lathes to put a, a, a wooden form on that lathe, stretch a piece of silver over it, and you could raise a pot that way. Um, so rather than having to hammer out a pot with, with your hammer, you could just put on the steam engine and raise it. So Gorham starts making pots in, in, this, in this manner, and the prov they display them in the early 18, I think it was 1850, and they displayed in their store, and the Providence Journal says, this was superbly elegant. And then Charles Carpenter, who Holly referenced in the 1980s, said, yeah, it's actually pedestrian and dumpy. But, <laughs> but, but aesthetics. <laughs> but, but John, you know, to capitalize, he took on partners, two cousins, actually, uh, Gorham Thurber first and then Louis Dexter, who was Lucian Sharp's brother-in-law. And, uh, and he got his partners together in 1852, and he said, look, uh, I want to be able to handle silver as though it were putty. Uh, we, we need to you know, really be able to make this more malleable than it even is. And he says, I have an idea. I'm, I'm going to take a steamship, the steamship Arctic here, over to England. And I'm going to meet with James Nasmith, the world's most famous toolmaker. And I'm going to uh, present him with an idea I have for a steam press to make flatware. Well, I don't know where he got off thinking Nasmith would even receive him, although Nasmith was um, you know, very impressed by New England Yankees. He thought that the, um, the silversmiths in his local area of Birmingham, Patricroft, were too hidebound and, and stuck in their own way, old ways. And so when this, you know, this Yankee comes over from uh, across the pond to meet with them, and he, he actually hears them out. But I love his trip over here. He's on, you know, again, the guy's fascinated with process. Second day at sea, he's still seasick. And he wants to see how the steam engine works in a thousand horsepower steam engine. So he sneaks down into the prohibited area of the engine room. And he notes 24 firemen and, and three watches, 18 coal burners, all connected with the boilers. And then a guy sidles up to him and says, and one of the crew, the firemen in the, in, the, in the engine room, a very warm place this, sir, yes. And they had a little general conversation. We usually expect a finer treat from the people, from the passengers what come down here. So, he, yeah, he gets it. So he gives the guy 50 cents. <laughs> well, 20 minutes later, an officer approaches and says, we don't usually let the passengers down here. Well, I, I just paid the fine. Oh, no, he wasn't authorized. Sir. I'm the only one who can do that. So, <laughs> and so he sneaks upstairs to a, a crew lounge, and he just watches from up there. Um, and as an aside, that ship, the Arctic, sank a year and a half later. Luckily, he wasn't on it, uh, off of Newfoundland when it got cleaved by a, a French schooner. And uh, the, um, most of the crew survived. A lot of the male passengers survived. No woman and children survived. It was the, the exact opposite of what's supposed to happen. There was a bunch of uh, scallywags and rogues on that boat. <laughs> so, 
So he, so he convinces, he does, you know, he doesn't go straight to James Nasmus' shop. He spends a month touring England looking at process. He sees how they use, um, you know, electrified uh, current and, and a suspension of silver to draw the silver to plate. He learns plate silver and uh, more than a decade goes by before he adopts that at Gorham, but he does. He learned, he, he, for two weeks, he immerses himself in the hot, laborious job of, of casting, mold casting in sands. And then he gets to Patrick Hoff and he says to James Nasmith, I have an idea. See, Nasmith had invented the steam hammer in order to um, bang out uh, the long crankshafts on steam engines. And he also invented the pile driver. And so John said, you know, we can make that a little smaller still in order to lift up a heavy head with steam power and a piston and drop it onto a blank die with uh, holding flatware cartridges, you know? Uh, uh, so he, what he wants to do is, is get a machine that can just press all day long patterns into flatware. And Nassiman says, you know, I've been waiting for one of these locals to ask me for such a thing, I'll do it. And he, uh, he ships to Gorham. Uh, now these th steam presses here are a later version, much heavier and much more of them. But they arrive in Providence in 1852 and he starts banging out flatware, spinning up um, hollowware. And you know, you might think that this would almost kill silversmiths, right? It actually increases the avail the opportunities for silversmiths because, like, there's a, this was a technological discontinuity where, like, when the the uh, the steam powered automobile came out, right? That was a a competence destroying um, technological development for his father, his late father, who was a harness maker. You didn't need many more harnesses. But this is actually a competence enhancing uh, technology because now silversmiths don't have to be stuck, you know, banging out a little thing at a time. They, they, they have basically a hollow where the canvas to, to work, to chase, to do better and more designs. It reduces labor costs so people can afford it more. Um, so really now there's, you know, more and more uh, uh, reasons and jobs like die sinking, you know, somebody has to, you know, take the, the, the hard technical job and, 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 you know, of designing dies. And uh, so it really made, created a need for, for silversmiths. Oh, that's not right. So, so he, uh, he grows that little company into this. And, uh, you know, it, it, he, he's, uh, this is from, you know, the 18, he's, he gets the, that steam press in the early 1850s. And within, you know, by the time of the Civil War, he's going great guns down there on Steeple Street. And because he needs so many, um, you know, silversmiths, he gets them from England because they, they, they weren't trained in America. Um, I touch you, this guy, George Wilkinson. Wilkinson was an English immigrant silversmith working at the Ames Shovel Company, making shovel, shovels and swords. And, uh, and John Gorham thought, well, that's a waste of his talent. And so he offered him triple the money and, and a, a share of the stock in the newly incorporated company in 1865 to, to come to work for him. And uh, he, he, so he really, he, he comes out with, um, um, he takes design from Rococo to neoclassical, giving Gorham an edge on everybody else who hadn't thought of this or seen it. And, and <laughs> this is, I almost want to hate on this guy, but, <laughs> but, I, but I can't. Um, because in 1875, uh, I guess it was, that was earlier than that, but, but it, it was in the 70s, he, John Gorham hires this fellow, Edward Holbrook, to uh, be his sales agent in New York City. And Holbrook was a, a, a wealthy person. He had married into the Swift family of Boston railroad magnates. And he took some of that money and he bought some of that newly available Gorham stock, as much of it as he could, so that he was actually a, a large stockholder. And uh, he, because he was a salesman, then he, he realized that in order to sell stuff, I need good design. So just like Wilkinson, Holbrook, 
and, and Gorham are all on the same page. They're, they're all major stockholders. They understand for this company to succeed, we have to be, you know, on the cutting edge of design. Um, but Holbrook was also a master businessman, and John Gorham wasn't. Um, the thing Gorham did in the early 1870s is he invested with his brother-in-law in the, in the Thurber gold mine of Virginia. They were going to find gold in the Appalachian Mountains of Virginia. Well, they didn't. And, uh, and, uh, and, and then the Panic of 1873 struck, probably the worst depression in American history outside of the Great Depression. And Gorham had a, you know, all the executives had to cut their, price, their pay in half. And Gorham pledged his stock what he did is he said, okay, I need to borrow from the firm, and collateral is my stock. Well, he lost it. So in 1875, they kicked him out, the founder. And now the company is run, not, not, not by family people that helped start it, but in a classic, um, you know, managerial capitalist, uh, you know, hierarchical succession of executives. And this guy, they hired a president, but this guy was the titular power behind the throne. Brilliant businessman. He, uh, what he did is in the 1890s, the, the, uh, a consortium of silversmiths got together and, and they called themselves silversmiths. And they, they were, so it was all these different silver companies under one umbrella. And, and they wanted to address uh, concerns in the trade, like price, fluctuating price of silver, things like that. So, in the, with the panic of 1893 hits, a lot of these people are getting out of the silver business. Well, Edwin Holbrook is brilliant. He buys low. He buys up these companies, a half a dozen of them, puts them under the umbrella of silversmiths, and then he builds out in South Providence on Adelaide Avenue a, uh, a huge uh, plant uh, beautiful plant in, in order to, uh, you know, accompany all his businesses. Well, he, uh, by the early 1900s, he owns 40% of all silverware being traded in the United States, which really gives him the ability to uh, do things that other people couldn't or wouldn't dare try, such as, you know, hey, um, you know, we're making sterling silver. Let's make something more pure than sterling, right? Instead of 92.5%, let's go with 95%. And uh, so they did it because they could and because it was beautiful. And the silversmiths loved it. Instead of using the machinery, ironically, the machinery that they pioneered, they're now using hand tools and, and raising up Model A silver. Um, they, <laughs> this is just showing off. This is... <laughs> This is, this is the ladies' writing desk that they sent to the 1903 St. Louis Exposition with the um, sole goal of winning the gold medal, which they did. There were 75 pounds of silver in this thing, all kinds of rare woods. If you look at this upstairs, you'll see 24 different faces staring back at you from this. Uh, kind of a highly impractical thing. But, and, uh, you know, and by this point, the, the latest great designer, William Christmas Codman, had, had made it... Um, and, and uh, I don't think it's really advancing um, art at the time, but it's just showing we can do this, so we did. <laughs> now, I, I think that um, the, really the beginning of the end for Gorham goes way back to the First World War, um, where Edward Holbrook said, hey, there's money to be made making bullet casings. And before the United States was even in the war, he made nickel bullet casings for the S Serbian army and the Russian army. And then when America jumped in, he, he, he moved the plant over to, uh, to East Providence, that where they made hand grenades. And uh, be careful at all times when you're assembling hand grenades. <laughs> well, no, no kidding, right? <laughs> but, but one thing you'll see in this picture is every woman in it is, is white. And the NAACP observed the same thing and, and sued for discrimination. And Gorham's answer was, well, um, the, the white woman wouldn't work with the black woman. Well, it, then I don't know how that case resolved, but this was not unusual. In, the, in fact, it was de rigueur in the metal trades industry. Um, Brown and Shop didn't hire its first black worker until the 1920s, and the machinist union itself uh, was segregated until the 1940s. 
Now, after the World War, the company, whoops, well, regained its equilibrium in, uh, and made that beautiful piece there, which I think was the last of their great works, other than what Bert Sebring, and, and Bert Sebring managed to do in the 60s. But I, I really think that by the 1920s, uh, the, the writing was on the wall. The Gorham had reached its peak probably around the early 1900s, my opinion. <laughs> Thank you.